Hello, uh, welcome to the RMG workshop section on simulating chemical kinetic mechanisms. We're going to talk a little bit about model analysis and model analysis software, the types of type, different types of simulations, um, and uh, sensitivity analysis, and then we'll do a practice example. Um, for that practice example, um, let's make a mechanism to simulate later. You should go to the RMG Pi slash example slash RMG slash propane branching folder and uh, run the input file there in RMG. Um, this should take a little while, but not too long. So in, in the workflow that RMG is a part of, uh, building and refining a chemical kinetic mechanisms, there are three main steps, um, building the model, analyzing the model, and improving the parameters in the model um, that are typically done on a, in a loop. So model construction can be automated by RMG and quantum chemistry calculations, as we'll show later on in the workshop and we'll talk about, can be automated using ARC, which we'll show later. However, model analysis is much trickier to automate, although we're working on things that approach that in some aspects with our software, the Reaction Mechanism Simulator RMS. And as a result of this, this trickiness, um, it isn't at all uncommon for model analysis to represent a majority of the human hours spent on a project. Um, and since it can be such a time sink, it's, it's worth taking some effort to minimize the time between having a new mechanism and knowing what pathways are running, what has changed since the last run, what doesn't make sense in the mechanism, and what parameters are worth improving. And this makes it very valuable to have access to the best tools and know them well enough to use them effectively and efficiently. So our software, the Reaction Mechanism Simulator, is an open source simulation software developed by the Green Group. Um, it's written in Julia, which is a new open source um, language um, that is JIT compiled. And essentially what JIT compilation allows it to do is it allows it to, in general, feel like you're programming in Python or MATLAB, um, but have the speed of, of C++ and Fortran. And it has an enormous focus on modern numerical methods and some of the best um, differential equation software available. Um, and also has a, fo a, a strong focus in automatic differentiation, adjoint methods, and multi-threading, um, which makes them very easy to integrate. It's also much easier to modify than Fortran and C++ codes if a feature you need isn't available. Um, the documentation is available at the web address here. And um, in, in general, RMS is designed for dealing with large chemical mechanisms efficiently. Um, it can run all the simulations RMG itself can run. Um, it has an emphasis on ZRD reactors, although it can do some uh, um, connected reactors. And uh, also a large focus on mechanism analysis. So there are, some of the two, there are two other very popular softwares in the field, which are Chemkin and Kentera. Um, Chemkin is a commercial software, um, while Kentera is an open source software that's written in C++. Um, the big benefit of Chemkin for a lot of people is that it has a GUI. Um, it's a little bit outdated, but it's, it's a major plus for people that um, really like to avoid programming. Um, However, if you want to, if you need to do something that involves programming or that's easier in your workflow, um, Chemkin is one of the worst choices um, because it's, it's, the scripting's a bit painful. There are Python wrappers available for all of these, um, but the Chemkin one is um, by far the hardest to work with. Um, RMS's big advantage over these is that it's able to integrate a lot of these. It's both easier to develop and it's able to integrate a lot of these um, automatic differentiation and adjoint sensitivity methods that are very, very possible, but very, very difficult to implement in um, Fortran and C++. So there are lots of different types of simulations you might run with a chemical kinetic mechanism. You might run a very complicated uh, Kinex and CFD simulation or those sorts of things. But for RMG, we're usually looking at large scale models. And so we'll focus on the types of simple simulations that you would, that are very feasible and easy to run for large scale models that are mostly of interest. So looking at ZRD reactors, uh, which are our primary focus here, although we'll talk a little bit about um, 1D steady state. Um, the mole balance here is the um, flow in minus flow out plus um, reaction change in moles. And then you have an energy balance accounting for 
all the different sorts of effects from flow in, flow out, and volume change, et cetera. So the first sort of very common case is the constant temperature and constant pressure um, batch gas phase reactor. Generally, you assume no flow in or flow out. You assume ideal gas and homogeneous. And you end up with a very simple equation, which is essentially just that the, um, the change in the moles is just the reaction term. And the volume, but the, however, the volume does change as a function of how many moles you have in your system. Um, since the temperature is constant, um, all the rate coefficients are, are generally, are, in most cases, are constant. And, um, and it's very easy to simulate. Um, but generally, this doesn't lead to sort of um, ignition-like behavior. It's, as you can see here, it's a very sort of slow burn sort of reaction. Um, there's also sort of the liquid analog to that is the constant temperature and constant volume liquid batch reactor, um, which looks very similar, except um, the volume doesn't change because the um, you're looking at a very a dilute system. Although you could treat temperature as a function of time, as and you could also do that for the other one. A very common case in combustion is zero D ignition in a cylinder. Um, or an RCM. Um, generally, you assume there's no flow in or flow out. You assume it's ideal gas and homogeneous. And then you generally assume that your um, the it's constant. The cylinder is constant volume and adiabatic. Or if it's if you're simulating the initial stroke, you just you might assume that it's um, volume is a function of time adiabatic. Um, and this gives you this, this system of equations um, where you, you still have the same reaction term per moles, but you also have to account for um, the energy change and the energy that results from these reactions in the adiabatic um, reactor. And this gives you these sort of ignition um, situations. So here, up here is a simulation of uh, volume as a function of time, um, simulating the upstroke. And here, it's just compressing the cylinder up to this point, or it heats up to here. And then it's sort of the volume at this after this point is relatively constant, and the radical build up and heat build up, builds up until it hits it reaches ignition, um, and then stays up here. Which of course a cylinder is probably not going to actually reach this this um, temperature, but um, in the simulation that's what happens because you're simulating it. You're assuming it's adiabatic, um, and you see similar behavior in the mole fractions. So. Um, another common case is the zero D shock tube. Um, I won't go into the details of the shock tube configuration, but um, in general, it actually looks um, for a for a single element within the shock tube. It actually looks very similarly to the uh, ignition in a cylinder case. Um, and oftentimes, you can treat it like ignition in a cylinder as a as a constant volume element that's just sort of traveling along the shock, um, but um, sometimes, often time, other times it's treated as constant pressure or um, with a pressure profile. And both of these actually give relatively similar results, although they differ slightly. Um, and the equations are slightly different um, for the pressure, the um, constant pressure case um, versus the constant volume. Another very common case is a CSTR or JSR, depending on a continuously stirred tank reactor or a jet stirred reactor, depending on what field you're in. Um, for gas phase, gen you generally assume it's ideal gas, homogeneous. You have one inlet and one outlet, and you often usually want to solve for the steady state um, condition for this. Um, one way to do that is to sim simply simulate the equations out. Another way to do it is to just solve um, with these derivatives as zero, solve these cases. Um, however, you have to be a little bit careful in, in these, especially if they're adiabatic. Um, or, 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 or where, if you're accounting for heat ch temperature change. And that's because there can be more than one steady state for a CSTR or a JSR. And um, it, this depends a bit on the relationship between the heat generation and removal rates. Um, and if you look over here, where blue is the rate of heat removal and red is the heat generated, in some of these ignition cases, you can where here, because the removal rate is higher than the heat generated, if you're at, at a state here, it will generally slide down to this state um, where they're equal. And there's heat pushing it this way and um, heat removal pushing it that way. 
and this is a stable steady state whereas this state is unstable because if you move in this direction it's generating more heat that's removing and it'll slide all the way up here um, whereas in, there's another st stable steady state so and so in practice in a experiment you probably won't really see this steady state um, but your algorithm finding the zeros might find is might may find this one rather than these ones which are stable and also that there's multiple solutions here is another sort of aspect here where you may care about this one but you may be getting this one another very very common one is a plug flow reactor um, and so uh, one so the most common way to sort of configure this is kind of looking at sort of the um, you assume that it's radially homogeneous, but that it might be changing uh, with respect to the distance down the plug flow reactor, and it might be changing with respect to time. But assuming there's no radial diffusion, and often you, you'll, you'd assume constant temperature or, or a temperature profile here, um, you can get it down, down to this. If you neglect axial diffusion, um, at the steady state, um, and you assume that you're you're at steady state with this reactor, um, which is common in experiments, um, you can end up with this equation, um, which is actually quite nice because you can actually reformulate this instead, treating this z, converting this z based on velo the velocity, um, the average velocity to a um, residence time you can reformat it into the same equation that you use for the batch constant temperature, either constant volume or constant pressure reactor. Um, and in general, um, usually you would use that reactor to simulate these situations um, rather than a specialized plug flow reactor, unless you care about axial diffusion. Um, but these large complicated multi, multi-dimensional ones are, are much trickier to solve. And, um, a lot of the time it isn't that um, terribly relevant, although there are some cases where the axial diffusion is important. So another common case is flames. Um, and usually for these large models, you're interested in the 1D steady state. Um, these are a bit more complicated. You have species and heat um, diffusive fluxes going on and some flow going on. Um, these are important. I won't go into too much detail on how to simulate them as they're a little bit more complicated. But now let's let's talk a little bit about solvers and tolerances, um, which are very important for um, how when you're actually running these these simulations and making sure that your simulations are you're getting the right results and that you're um, they aren't messed up, which is actually um, something you do have to be careful about. And these choices are general; it can be very important, and in general, they're coupled and. Which solver is fastest often depends on what tolerance you're trying to simulate to. Lower, tighter tolerances will tend to crash more often and be slower, but there are actually a lot of situations where they can be necessary to get the simulation results right. And so for relative tolerances for simulations, a very typical choice is 1e negative 6. Um, in general, if you think physically about the system, in a typical kinetic system, uh, especially for large kinetic systems due to the parameter uncertainties, it's really rare that you would ever have a component of the model that you would be able to tell if it was accurate within 1%. So it, there's not that much point in shooting for a higher global relative tolerance than around 1e negative 2. Now that doesn't clearly correspond to a local relative tolerance that you feed the solver, but it probably means that as a rule of thumb it should be kept um, 1e negative 3 or less. In general, um, my experience with this is, is that most of the time increasing the relative tolerance within these limits isn't very harmful to the solution, doesn't make an enormous difference, um, and sometimes can prevent your simulation from crashing. Um, sometimes, uh, which, how, how, if, the, if, if that crashing is um, important or not is um, hard to tell sometimes, um, but you have to be careful around it. Now, absolute tolerances are a little bit more complicated. So there's lots of different default simulation absolute tolerances. ChemChem -chem will give you 1e negative 12. Kintera will give you 1e negative 15. And RMG kind of, uh, typically the examples have 1e negative 16. And why does this matter? 
Lower tolerances take longer to simulate, they crash more often, and they change what solvers can be used. And if you, you're able to have a higher um, absolute tolerance, some solvers will be, will be faster than others. Um, however, this absolute tolerance actually matters a whole lot. And if you look here at this, this, this simulation, so here, um, this blue line is the experiment. And these lines are the simulations. And in general, um, this is, uh, so this is sort of the simulation line, which is closest to the, um, the experiment. And in general, what we see here is that if you're below 1e e negative 15, or if you're, sorry, if you're above 1e e negative 15, you are going to be about a factor. You're going to be about a factor of three off here. You're going to be in this area. And this is an enormous difference um, for an ignition delay calculation. This is the difference between a model that looks like it's doing pretty well and a model that's not so, not so great. And what really sort of to get this um, within reasonable sort of tolerance is what this says is that you need to have it to about a 1e e negative 18 tolerance, which is much tighter than, is significantly tighter than any of these default tolerances. For another situation, say a, a flow tube simulation here, um, we can see that there, there's sort of a critical tolerance around here at 1e negative 8. Now let's just try the same simulation um, at uh, 10 bar instead of 1 bar, and it changes even more. The critical tolerance seems to be 1e negative 11. However, for other simulations, such as this one, running the super minimal example for RMG at high temperature, um, there's not really that much change, um, regardless of how high you take the absolute tolerance. Um, so in general, what's, what's worth understanding is, is that for each, of each problem, in general, there's a threshold absolute tolerance below which you have to simulate, or otherwise the simulation will be screwed up. And once you're below that threshold, the improvements are relatively minor. Um, this threshold is highly variable and problem dependent, um, although it's worth noting that it's, uh, it's related to the presence of chemical feedback loops, um, particularly OH feedback loops and low temperature combustion. Um, and in some cases, it is significantly below the default threshold for current softwares. Um, although typically rules of thumb is generally that 1e negative 16 is fine and 1e negative 20 is considered very safe, but it's, it's worth um, it's worth considering this because this particular case is actually quite important. And this is a very important difference in the simulation and is the difference between you thinking your model matches experiment and it thinking it doesn't match experiment, which, it, which can be a terrible time sink when you're working on a project. So most codes use one of two solvers for solving these ZOD reactors. Um, Chemkin and RMG's internal solver use DASPAC, a DAE solver, and Cantera uses CVOD BDF. RMS is compatible with any solver in differential equations.jl. This includes CVOD BDF, Lasota, Rodus4, Kencarp4, Radout2A5, and TRBDF2. Um, the sort of the main differences between all of these. DASPAC will usually fail rather than give you a wrong answer. CVOD BDF is faster and it's a lot better at giving you an answer, but there are cases where CVOD BDF will give you the right answer and DASPAC will fail, and there are also cases where CVOD BDF will tell you it, exceed, it succeeded and give you the wrong answer. Um, as far as CVOD BDF versus the other ODE solvers, um, if your absolute tolerance is low enough, CVOD BDF and Lasota are definitely the fastest. But if you can get the absolute tolerance high enough, um, some of the other solvers can be faster, although it seems to be very um, dependent on, on the simulation, on what system you're trying to simulate. So now that we've, we've talked about um, running what sorts of simulations we're interested in and how to sort of um, run those simulations, and that lets you look at a lot of these sorts of the flexes and the concentrations of species and the profiles and all of that. But oftentimes, um, after looking at that, what you, what you, a, lot of, a lot of times what you really care about and what you really want to know is what, uh, what makes a difference in terms of the model? What parameters make the most difference? And 
a lot of times we're interested in this quantity here, um, which is called the local sensitivity. Um, we have some output variable u, some concentrate, some uh, species moles or uh, the temperature, and we're interested at in how varying uh, different parameter, individual parameters, rate coefficients, um, thermochemistry parameters, will affect this solution. Now one way we might look at this is through brute force local sensitivity analysis. We might compute this quantity by picking a single parameter from all of our parameters, some pj, and adjusting it by a perturbation, a very small perturbation, delta pj, and simulating to get the difference uh, with an initial simulation to get some delta u. And then delta u of t divided by this perturbation um, would in general give us the first term in an expansion with respect to that parameter around the simulation. So it, um, in a certain sense at each point, at each point along the simulation trajectory, it would tell you how much difference changing that parameter would make on the target species and variables to first order. Um, it's worth emphasizing that these quantities are path dependent as opposed to state dependent. The sensitivities approximate what would happen if you started the simulation with different parameters. So it, it depends on the initial condition and the entire trajectory of the simulation. Now, in a lot of cases, um, you want to compute a lot of these because you don't just care about one parameter. There are lots of tons of parameters in these um, chemical kinetic models that you care about and you want to get the sensitivities to. And running number of parameters simulations uh, can be a bit painful. And um, for that, what's, you, what's you usually used when people want to get lot, this for lots of parameters is forward local sensitivity analysis. So by um, differentiating the sensitivity um, with respect to time can, will give us this system of equations, um, which essentially relates the Jacobian of the original system and the, um, the gradient with respect to that parameter to the sensitivity to that parameter. And by extending these, this out to multiple parameters, um, we're able to um, generate an augmented differential equation system that we can solve that gives us the sensitivity to all of all of the outputs to all the parameters we pick. Um, now, in practice, usually we're interested in finding which, uh, which parameters, all, how all of the parameters affect a handful of targets. Um, however, in this approach, all of the output sensitivities to each parameter are coupled. And in general, this means to compute the sensitivity of a species to every parameter, we need to solve the entire um, augmented system of equations, including every parameter, um, which is a quite large n species times n parameters size order. Um, so for 1,000 species and 100,000 reactions, you need to solve a stiff ODE system with more than 1 billion variables. Um, and this is, this is the approach that RMG, Chemkin, and Kentera do. Although Chemkin does it a little bit um, more, uh, does, does it a bit more smartly than the other, so significantly uh, more smartly than some of the other softwares. RMS can also do that, but it has, it, um, as I'll, I'll talk about next slide, has a little bit better ways to do that, or, or what's often a better way to do that. So adjoint local sensitivities are a different way of computing the same properties to, to some extent. Um, these big differences is the adjoint sensitivities are a com I, I won't go through the math. They're a little bit they're significantly more complicated than the than uh, forward sensitivities. But the end result of them is that they give the sensitivity of any function of the solution. So it could be a solution variable. Um, it could not be. It could be some function of the solution variables with respect to all of the parameters at the specified time t. Um, the key, key thing to note here is, is that um, you could, that could be a solution variable with respect to all of the parameters with a single evaluation. Um, these, uh, so essentially what, what you do with adjoint sensitivities is you solve this um, adjoint differential equation, which is an equa differential equation in n species variables from, uh, to get the adjoint variables a function of time and then use that adjoint variable to um, evaluate an integral that's in n parameters dimensions. Um, 
these dimensions are the number the number of things that the dimensions involved is probably the most important thing to understand here um, and it improves it improves the order and in tests of adjoint sense local sensitivities and RMS um, even working on stuff with just 26 species um, the adjoint sensitivity in that test was about 100 times faster than forward sensitivities um, and it should scale better with mechanism size than forward sensitivities um, so to talk a bit more broadly, in practice, for chemical kinetic systems, um, adjoint is usually the most practical in terms of simulation time um, because it's quite, um, well, the intermediate sensitivities may sound tempting. It's quite rare that it's useful to have them, although it can be very important to pick the right endpoint for your adjoint simulation. It's also very rare for a kineticist to need sensitivities to more than 10 different species. And your adjoint makes it super easy to run those in parallel. Um, although forward sensitivities can be accelerated through some uh, multi-threading, other parallelization, and by chunking the parameters. And that can speed it up quite a lot, um, we found. Um, Chemkin, in particular, it's worth talking about, has a very nice, um, somewhat separate method for doing forward sensitivities that mimics differentiating through the solver, and it performs um, quite well. Um, but broadly, um, sort of the differences here is, um, so for the forward and brute force approaches, you end up solving your evaluations for the differential equation or integrals you're solving um, are the size is n species times n parameters, whereas in the adjoint case, it's order of n species or order of n parameters. Um, which is a much better scaling. Um, the forward approach does give you the sensitivity at every point in the trajectory, whereas adjoint only gives you the sensitivity at the end point. Um, the forward also, um, adjoint can also be used to generate any function of the solution variables, uh, if so desired, um, which can be useful, but isn't a, isn't a common thing, especially in chemical kinetics. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, global sensitivities, um, which are sort of a uh, is a different, uh, broader and bigger way of looking at sort of analyzing these mechanisms. And it tends to be much more expensive. So in chemical kinetic mechanisms, we have a lot of parameters that have high uncertainties. And this means that in many cases, the mechanism you're simulating might not look similar to the real mechanism. And this means that the local sensitivity values that you're calculating may be an entirely inaccurate representation of what matters in your model. And so we might want to try sampling the parameter space more broadly away from the original set of parameters. Additionally, an even often um, bigger important component of this is that you're interested in putting uncertainty bounds on your simulations. And if you can un assign uncertainty values to your parameters, um, Global sensitivity analysis, or broadly what, you're, what we try to do with it, provides a way for you to do that as well. Um, and you can look over here, um, and you can see sort of where your sensitivity and um, derivative might be different than the true behavior of the solution and what it looks like. And also down here, sort of the value of knowing where your error bars are and knowing whether your data points um, overlap with your simulation. Um, which is a good justification of your uh, that your model and experiment agree, um, which is often hard to get otherwise in terms of these things, especially if you have very uncertain parameters. Now, before I talk a little bit more about global sensitivity methods, I'm going to talk about some semi-global sensitivity methods, which really isn't a, that's not a clear classification, but there's kind of two methods that don't really fit well in either global or local sensitivity analysis camps. Um, the first is the one at a time method or the OAT method, um, which is essentially brute force sensitivity analysis, except the delta PJ is a much larger perturbation. Um, typically, this is, this is constant for a parameter type, um, but you, this could be done based on uncertainties if the uncertainties are known. And what this lets it do is this, to some extent, extends the, how far you move away from the original simulation. And this can allow the sensitivity analysis to pick up on a lot of things it might miss locally without incurring too much expense. I mean, running all these simulations is, is expensive, but not expensive compared to what you, would, you have to do to properly span the global sensitivity analysis space. Um, 
another another method is local uncertainty analysis, um, which is essentially you just run local sensitivity analysis and then multiply those sensitivities by the uncertainties in the associated parameter, which can give you a rough estimation of how much uncertainty uh, tar in a target species might associate be associated with each parameter and also a general um, estimate of the uncertainty in the prediction for that target species. And this can be helpful with determining what parameters are most important to improve. RMG has an impl its own implementation of this method. So back to sort of the broad global sensitivity analysis. So generally, um, the idea is, is that you define an uncertainty distribution on the parameters. Um, Oftentimes, the, par actual, the parameters in a kinetic model, because of um, group how group additivity works and how rate rules works, are correlated. And if you accounting for that correlation makes an enormous difference in terms of how you define these distributions. And then you generally sample this space running a ton of simulations. And you might think about just sort of picking, uh, basically picking points within the distribution, sampling the space randomly. Um, until you have uh, what you think is the right number of simulations, and then you post-process that information. That gives you, one, gives you the ability to put a distribution on the predictions of your model, and also it allows you to calculate some sensitivity indices, which, uh, global sensitivity indices, which can be useful for determining what's important. There's a lot of different ways used to accelerate global sensitivity analysis over Monte Carlo. Um, I won't go into details on any of them. Uh, they're a little bit beyond this lecture, but sobald sampling, polynomial chaos expansions, high dimensional model representations. Um, in general, all of these, even all of these methods are very expensive for large models. Um, um, RMG in particular has an implementation of global sensitivity analysis that uses, utilizes PCE. Um, so now I'll, I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit uh, Give a bit broader some broad warnings about model analysis and things to keep in mind. So individual rate coefficients, if you're varying them independently of the rest of the model, they typically have three regimes. In one case, they're so fast that it's not rate limiting anything in the mechanism and it's going to dominate any branching. And in that case, it's um, it's not going to be sensitive because wiggling it isn't going to affect the, the overall rate or the branching. Well, if the rate is very, very slow, um, sufficiently slow, there won't be there will be almost no flux going through it, and it won't impact any branchings. Um, and in both of those cases, um, it won't the rate coefficient won't be sensitive. Um, however, in between, it possibly could be sensitive. Um, and um, the sort of issue that you constantly run into in all of these analyses is that the uncertainties that are typical in kinetics are very often large enough to bridge between these regimes, um, which um, makes a, a lot of these um, more local analyses and even global sensitivity analyses um, tricky to handle and tricky to really um, pick up what, what the real stuff is. Um, And uh, in particular, local sensitivity analysis is very susceptible to this. Um, and it won't pick up those so fast or so slow regimes. Um, and you can augment with flux analysis, which can be helpful in catching things that are so fast in the so fast regime, but it isn't very much help in the so slow regime. And slow rea reactions that shouldn't be as slow as they are is, um, are very tricky to deal with. Um, another sort of important aspect of this is, is that local sensitivity analysis tells you what, not why. It doesn't, it doesn't grain down to the flexes and why this branching works or because this rate is limiting this step. Um, it just tells you what matters when you wiggle the parameters. And often the why is very important, both in terms of improving the model and in terms of um, talking about the chemistry that's going on within the mechanism. Um, so warnings about global sensitivity analysis. So global sensitivity analysis is very dependent on having accurate uncertainties, and these are quite hard to come by right now. Um, RMG can generate uncertainties, and we're working on improving them, but they're very general, general estimates currently, and they don't have parameter level re resolution. Um, global sensitivity analysis is also very expensive for large models, and 
Um, while it could be a really handy tool for these for much smaller models, it's um, running it for a very large model can be very expensive and sort of hard to handle. Um, and sometimes it, in a lot of, a lot of cases it may not be um, it may be more trouble than it's worth to um, to run this properly. And you probably want a very if you're for a large model, you probably want a very good reason why you're running global sensitivity analysis. It's also susceptible to actually a lot of the same issues as local sensitivity analysis. Um, well, within good uncertainties, um, if you have good uncertainty values, um, GSA should sample those in between regimes, unlike local sensitivity analysis. But that doesn't mean that those in between regimes will re represent a significant portion of the samples that you take. If you say have 100 important rate coefficients, you predict those with 95% confidence interval with two, with, within two orders of magnitude and 95% confidence interval. Um, for branching, an order of magnitude change in the in-between is enough to drastically change predictions. Um, and this sort of assessment, which is um, probably better than reasonable, um, better, better in a lot of cases than in reality in a lot of cases, uh, that gives you about 32 rate coefficients that are at least an order of magnitude off. And you can ask what fraction of the samples look like the real model. And that's a tricky question. And to some extent, you can have cases where um, maybe this part looks like the real model, but this other part doesn't look like it. And in those situations, you can pick up chemistry and learn, learn sort of more about it. But this is sort of a, a thorny question in terms of global sensitivity analysis. And, um, and how, how useful it is for you to improve the model, particularly. Um, and then also, much like local sensitivity analysis, global sensitivity analysis tells you what, not why. And um, often the why is very important. And also, it's very, um, when you're dealing with all these, this complicated sampling procedure, it's often hard to tell what the, the, um, the, the why um, as a part of these global sensitivity analysis methods, because it involves understanding the coupling between these the uncertainty values and how these and the uh, the fluxes. So, broadly, in terms of when you're analyzing a mechanism, what you should what you need to look at is one. So, um, you should look at the sensitivities. Um, what thermo and rate coefficients affect the solution the most? Be careful. Sensitivities are helpful, but they aren't always the whole story. And um, you should look at the chemistry and sort of look at the what chemistries are present and do they make sense? And then also look and say, well, are there ones that you expected that aren't there? And figuring out the why of this to make sure that it's, um, that it's right and then it's consistent and that it makes sense. And then also sort of looking at the pathways involved and looking at what changes, what uncertainties could drastically change the course of your mechanism. So now let's let's simulate that mechanism from propane branching. So in order to do this example, um, you need to activate the RMS environment and then launch a, a Jupyter notebook with the command Jupyter space uh, notebook. Um, um, the RMS environment you should have created in the installation section. Um, and I believe you should uh, have already seen this section on uh, on uh, IPython notebooks and RMG. Um, so broadly, this should get you to this page, and then you'll want to go over here and pick Python 3. Um, this could be done in Julia, um, uh, but since most of this, and it's perfectly easy to do, it's just as easy to do this in Julia, but since the rest of this um, workshop is in Python, we'll be using Python. Um, so first, you need to run these uh, this set of imports. Um, to import RMS uh, differential equations, the differential, Julia's differential equations library, um, NumPy and Matplotlib. Um, and then you're going to want to read in uh, the, that, the, the RMS file from that propane branching example that you just ran. So you should take the chem63.rms file from the RMS directory and propane branching and put it somewhere where you know the directory and then put the path here. Um, so the, the first time you run all of these, this may take a little bit longer than um, you think it should because uh, the, 
uh, Julie has a couple different compilation layers, and some of it may compile when you run these import statements, and so it may take a little bit longer than expected. So first, we're going to pull this phase dict information out of here. And then from this dictionary, um, we're going to pull out the species objects and the reaction objects that are associated with this mechanism. And then we're going to feed them into an ideal gas object to form a phase, um, an ideal gas that has these species and these reactions in it. Next, we're going to define our initial conditions for the simulation and the type of simulation we're running. Since the propane branching example, um, which isn't a fantastic propane mechanism, but it's a, it's a nice um, it's a nice example just sort of to look at, um, especially because it, it doesn't include any pressure dependence and is only, was only run in RMG at 700 Kelvin and 10 bar. So we're going to run this simulation at 700 Kelvin and 10 bar. Um, uh, uh, or, uh, with, um, with air in a constant TP reactor here. And then we're going to simulate we're going to simulate for 60 seconds um, this domain. So we're going to form a reactor that um, has this time interval. And then we're going to run the simulation um, using the SIBO BDF solver from Julia differential equations with an absolute tolerance of 1 e negative 20 and a relative tolerance of 1 e negative 6. It should be very safe for these kinds of simulations. Once we have the differential equations solution object, we're going to feed this into a simulation object, which is just kind of a general RMS object that um, and enables you to generate plots and generate and run analysis of it. Um, uh, look as we'll we'll do down here. And we get to our first plot here. So we're going to plot the mole fractions um, from up to the the end of the reactor, and we're going to exclude nitrogen and oxygen, which are going to ha which have very high mole fractions, but. We already roughly know what they're going to do. Um, and here we can see um, trajectories here for water, CO2, CO, propane, and we can we can also see C3H6 and, and this species. And this tells us roughly what's going on. And this is this is always a good plot to make when you're running an analysis um, because it tells you when stuff's happening. And so now I can kind of take a look. And at these sort of low temperature chemistry, I'm very interested in terms of um, OH radical formulation, the OH feedback loops for this, um, which is related to why this example exists. And so I'd say I'm interested at about 7.5 seconds, just when the chemistry is starting to get off the ground. And so I might generate a flex diagram at those, those conditions with this command. And these sort of larger mole fraction plots are good sort of roadmaps in terms of looking at what, what points and what chemistry you're sort of interested in. And you can see, and this generates a flex diagram, which what's really nice about RMS's flex diagrams um, that's a significant improvement over what Chemkin and Kenteric can do that I'm aware of is that we're able to use the molecular structures, um, pull, the, pull the molecular structures out of the file. And what this lets us do is, um, it's a little, little bit jumbled sometimes, but you can see what chemistry is going on. Um, and you can see the OH feedback loop here where we have this, it reaches around, you add another oxygen over to here, this reaches around, and then um, you break that off, make an OH, and then break off another OH here, and make this, um, which breaks down. And this can broadly sort of tell you what sort of chemistries are going on. And you can look at and sort of track what species these dark circles mean species that are, um, that are concentrated, that have higher concentrations. Um, species without circles have, rel have low concentrations, and, which is common of radicals. Um, and these, uh, the flexes are scaled to both size and color. Um, the uh, lighter, lighter generally means a higher flux.
And so another thing we might be in, this sort of generally tells us what's sort of going on in terms of the flexes and what stuff's going where. Um, but we're also interested in terms of what's making radicals in these radically driven systems. And so our, one of my favorite plots um, is to plot the radical ROPs, um, the production and loss of radicals. And what this sort of tells us here is, is that we're primarily radicals are, are being lost um, through this reaction between HO2 radicals. And they're primarily being formed by these decays um, related to this species. These decays. And then also some from H2O2 decomposition at this, at this temperature. And we can also look at specific ROPs just around OH if we're, if we're interested in that. And we can see, um, see here sort of these, oh, the N-propyl is the sort of dot, OH reacting with propane to make N-propyl is the dominant loss. And then also significant is loss to make I-propyl. And then these other sort of other sources related to these um, feedback loops that produce OH. Um, well, another plot that's that you can also make here um, is if you're sort of look at this and you're sort of interested in how this is changing over time, you can make the ROP plot um, with respect to time. These can get a little bit messy if you don't pick the tolerance properly, and you need you may need to try it a couple times and adjust tolerances. And this will tell you roughly what um, what what source both uh, what's producing OH and what's causing OH loss. at different times during the simulation. And then, of course, um, we're interested in sensitivity analysis. Um, so I'll get this start, this adjoint sensitivity analysis started um, here. But um, it's worth noting that um, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, even for like 400 species models, there are a lot of cases where forward sensitivity analysis can take um, days to weeks, and um, an adjoint can take hours um, in a lot of cases. Um, so it's worth um, being careful about when you when you call these sensitivity methods. They're not necessarily fast, especially for large models. But for this one, it'll be relatively short. Now I'm just kind of to some extent I'm just kind of going through and dropping a couple of these different plots that you can make. But oftentimes what you'll kind of do is you'll be interested in particular species and what's going on with that. And so you'll go down and you'll pull up the um, ROPs for some, uh, for, for let's, let's say um, propane. Of course, that won't run right now because we're running the sensitivity analysis. But it's it's sort of um, mastering these plots and sort of understanding and knowing what sort of stuff to look for and being able to pull up. And one of the major goals of RMS has been to make it super easy to pull up this information. I've I've always found Chemkin Chemkin's GUI can do stuff a lot like this, but I've always found it very clunky and. Um, and, and a lot of times it's it can get slow and laggy and um, quite painful to work with. Whereas this stuff, um, well, since it, apart from sensitivity analysis, runs runs quite quickly. You can generate the molecular structures, see what's going on, and then you can run the ROP plots to look more closely at each of these pathways. We can run this uh, um, further on and in the middle of when everything's going on and look at how the chemistry looks like at each of these, these sorts of points. Um, so in terms of sort of knowing about um, all the stuff, RMS is documented at um, this, uh, this web website uh, at the um, under reaction mechanism generator github.io. Um, and it has information on sort of the, all, all of the all of the commands. Um, these are all um, the documentation is written for Julia, but the um, PyRMS commands are identical, except that um, you should swap semicolons for commas. Um, Rodley discusses the file format. Um, although if you're generating these with RMG, RMG should just be giving you the files. Um, and then also defining phases, initial conditions, domains. Um, 
we haven't we aren't doing an example for liquid reactor, but um, you uh, what's something that's really handy for liquid reactors defining constant species. Um, and uh, defining an ideal dilute solution, uh, which will depend on a solvent, which you'll need to um, get the parameters for. Um, but usually that's, that's, um, that's within the RNG database and easy to look up. And then all of the commands for all of these, these analysis tools. And here you can see we've got our adjoint sensitivities here that we finished. And we can look at sort of the, you can tell here that we've got some importance related to the OH branching between whether propane um, abstracts from the end carbon or from the center, center carbon. And also the um, H2O2 decomposition rate and these um, reactions between H2O2 and OH and then this, this, um, this reaction. Um, and this can be useful, uh, sensitivity analysis can be very useful for focusing your interests in terms of what stuff you want to look at. And maybe I want to look at, I look at this and I'm interested in um, how this interaction and looking at sort of these, these what reactions are affecting C3H6. And oftentimes, um, to some extent analysis, um, you do have to know what's what sort of to expect in the system. And it takes a little while if you're inexperienced to sort of look at these and try to figure out what looks reasonable in terms of think of other pathways stuff can do. And that's very helpful. Um, but it's also sort of um, these sort of flex analysis combined with sensitivity analysis and then sort of focusing on what reactions are important, what species are important in terms of all of that will get you a long way. And it's kind of the major steps for going in and in depth and trying to figure out what's going on and it it can get complicated in some cases especially when you're looking at all these time dependencies and um, especially often in cases when you're comparing two simulations um, it can get quite messy but i think we've we've laid out most of the tools happy to answer any questions in the uh um the um online the zoom sessions later on um uh, thank you for listening.